Science in pajamas. Science in pajamas. All right, so we are back, and today we're going to talk about natural selection. So, what natural selection is? It can be thought of as the mechanism by which individuals have inherited beneficial adaptations and show differential reproductive success. That is a very technical definition. So in other words, what it kind of means is those individuals with the better adaptations are able to live longer, have more offspring, and that trait gets passed on to their offspring so they live longer and have more offspring. So therefore, those with better adaptations are more likely to survive and thrive. Thrive meaning reproduce. Now, this is again based on the idea of survival of the fittest, which we talked about in a previous video. And we also said the big misconception about that is that it says, you know, we tend to think it means survival of the strongest, but it really doesn't. It just means whoever has the best adaptations for their environment to survive are the ones who will survive and they will have offspring, so i.e. thrive. Now we're gonna do some demonstrations to kind of illustrate that point. The first one's actually based on a real situation. So back along around the time of the industrial evolution, or evolution, revolution. Let's see if I can adjust this a little bit. See if that, this will work better. All right, just adjusting, adjusting. Want to see if that would work. Yep. So back around the time of the Industrial Revolution, there, I believe this occurred in Britain, please don't quote me on that, but there are certain kind of trees that have very like grayish, whitish um, coloration, or vice versa, I don't remember. But, or maybe it was more like a darker, anyways, so they had one complex coloration, either lighter or darker, and the moths which kind of matched and that camouflage would survive and the darker ones were easy prey. And then with all the soot and smoke from and pollution from the um, work or the factories, it changed the coloration of the trees, which then made it easier for the darker moths to survive. And thus the lighter ones were easy prey and the other ones survived and thrived. Now, Regardless of which way it went, we're going to kind of demonstrate that idea. Now, as a hunter, you do not want to expend energy you don't have, which means that you are going to go after whichever prey is the easiest to catch. That's why wolves and lions and all that, they go after the slow, the sickly, the elderly. Because you are going to, if you try going after the healthy ones, or the healthy prey, then you're going to end up expending a lot of energy and likely not get your reward, your prey, your food. So hunters always go after that which is the easiest prey because it takes less energy and that means that they can have a net gain from the energy they get when they eat. So let's say, you know, is use five units of energy to catch the prey, but you get 25 units of energy from it, so you still get a net gain of 20. As opposed to if it was healthy prey, or like you know, super fit healthy prey, then maybe you had to use 20 units of energy to get it, and you only got 25 back, so that means you only have a net gain of five units. So. Hunters will always go after the easier prey because it saves on them and their energy stores. So this is a demonstration. This is going to represent one possible environment. And then we are going to take some prey items, sprinkle them around. Now imagine if you were a hunter, which ones would you very easily be able to see and catch? Now I know some of us are being like, Miss Colmar, I can see the white ones like there and there and there. Yeah, 
But if you are a starving hunter, maybe you haven't eaten for a couple days, you're not going to worry about trying to find the hidden ones. You're going to be like, oh, I see that guy, and I see these, and I see these, and I see these, and I see these. And then over time, you're going to end up with most of these guys being eaten because they're very easy prey and a higher population of the white ones. So they are able to survive and thrive because it's harder for the prey to, or sorry, the predators to see these, which means they're more likely to survive and have offspring. It's very easy for the predators to see these, which means they're more likely to get eaten and thus not have as many offspring. Now, this only applies so long as the conditions in the environment stay the same. If the environment changes, if something in the environment changes, that can also affect which group is now considered the fittest. So, the environment change. And now if we're looking at this, yeah, we can still see where the black squares are, but the ones that are super duper easy to see are the white ones. So now the predators are gonna go after these guys, maybe catch the occasional dark one or black one, but they have the better camouflage. So it's gonna be harder for the predators to see them, which means it's gonna, they're more le likely to survive and have offspring. Whereas the white ones, they now, are very easy for the predators to see, so that means they're less likely to survive and have offspring. So that's looking at it from a um, prey standpoint. I'm looking at it from a prey standpoint. So whichever organism, in this case squares, had the better camouflage for their environment or the ones that were more likely to survive and pass on that trait to their offspring. All right. Well, we're going to do one more demonstration, this time from the predators. So we're going to kind of use this to represent um, Darwin's finches. So we're going to have different kinds of food items and three types of bird beaks. So we're going to have tongs as a type of bird beak. We're going to have chopsticks as a type of bird beak, and we're going to have fingers. So it's kind of like we have very pointed, small, slender beak, a broad, flat beak, and more of a um, short, stubby beak. All right. Now what we're, the goal of this is to show you how different kinds of beaks help with different kinds of food sources. So. Here is one possible food source. So if we were to look at this from the flat perspective, okay, he can get the large ones pretty good, but the small ones are a little harder to get. So since the big ones are so easy, that's the one he's gonna go for. I'm like nom 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 nom. So from the prey standpoint, the larger ones are not being selected for because it's very easy for this guy to eat them. But it's not as easy for this guy to get the small ones, so they're going to be more successful. If we look at this from the predator standpoint, imagine if it was only small after a while. He would not be very good at getting them. So that means that this beak isn't the ideal adaptation for this kind of prey. These ones, yeah, but not for these ones. Alright, well let's try our next bird type. So here we have the chopsticks. Chop, 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 chop. So it's hard to get the bigger ones. Most birds don't actually stab, so it's hard to get those. The small square ones aren't too bad to get if I'm very careful, but the round ones are harder. Notice how long it's taking me to get some of these. This is not a very good beak design for this kind of prey. Again, it's just, it takes too much time and too much energy to try and get prey with this beak. So this is not one that would be selected for. It was out of these two types, this guy 
would have the better chance of getting more prey quickly, which means he's going to survive, have lots of offspring, and this guy is likely to starve to death. All right, and then the next one, stubby one. So stubby one's not too bad. He does pretty good here. He's getting them of all sizes very, very easily. So even between this and the tong beak, this guy is able to get all of them pretty easily. So this would actually be the ideal beak type for this kind of prey. So if we were to have a race between these two, this guy would get more prey than this guy. So that just shows you a little bit about how with one type of food, the predators, ah, these are going all over the place. Ah, and there it is. All right. Now with this type of prey, you can see that ah, certain beaks work better. But as we know, that's why Darwin hypothesized about the differences in the beak types is because not all islands had the same prey. Well, here we have some rice. All right, let's try this now. Hey, I got one, two, and a half. Not very good, is it? No, I'm not getting very much at all. So that's not a very good beak type for this particular kind of prey. I'm going to put that back in. All right, let's try this beak type. I was holding these exactly correct. So it's a little more direct, and honestly, if I was holding these properly, it probably would be even better. But these, not exactly the best case either. Again, if I was doing it correctly, I probably would have more success. All right, so now let's try. So this seems like a very successful prey. It's hard for all three of them to pick up. So it's a very, very successful prey item. All right, let's try our last prey then and compare it with the other beaks. All right. Try to make sure the screen doesn't go to sleep because I'm trying to make sure I can see what I'm doing. All right. So here is our last prey item. So I can get it pretty easily with this one, with my um, fingers, but I'm not getting a good grip. I'm just barely grabbing them. Cause I'm trying to keep it as much like a beak as possible. So I'm not trying to like, you know, curl in or anything. So I'm able to, but it's not a good grip. This, if this were a prey that actually fought back, it would do a very good job of surviving. Uh, not too bad with this one. Again, it's not a very strong grip. So, if it was a prey that fights back, it would definitely win. Because, yeah, I can do it, but it's not a tight grip. These ones are, surprisingly enough, actually the tightest grip so far. So, this one is more likely suitable for these ones. Yeah. 
So we can kind of see how different beaks are more designed for different types of prey. At least that's what I'm hoping that we got out of this. All right. So in conclusion, natural selection. It is those with the better adaptation for that particular environment are the ones that are going to survive longer, have more offspring, and their offspring are going to live long, have more offspring until you have a population that has that trait. Um, some misconceptions. We're not talking about, when we discuss natural selection and adaptations and all that, we're not talking about it in terms of an individual, meaning it's not the individual that's adapting. An individual has a particular trait and it just so happens to help it live longer. So then over the generations, more and more individuals of that population have that trait and that is what allows the population to survive. So we're not talking about one individual spontaneously changing. No, there are different versions of traits, mutations, and things like that that can occur naturally. And if it helps an organism to survive better, then it'll live longer. And then it'll pass on that trait because it's going to have more offspring. And it'll eventually get into the entire population. I shouldn't say get into, but over generations, you're going to see a higher percentage of the population with that trait because all the ones with it are living longer, having babies, and then more babies, and then more babies. And even when they die, then their babies still have the trait. They're having babies. So over time, it's these small changes that lead to bigger changes within the whole population. And when we talk about natural selection, we're talking about it in terms of nature. That's in the name, natural selection. So like the idea of our the dogs that we have today, they are not a product of natural selection. They're a product of what we call artificial selection. So what that means is over many, many generations, we had, or way, way back, there were some mutations that were born in puppies and that we were like, yeah, yeah, I like that mutation. So I'm just going to take that puppy with that particular trait and I'm going to breed that puppy. The other ones I'm not going to breed because I want this particular trait. And over many, many generations of doing that, we've bred for certain traits in certain breeds of dogs. So for instance, dachshunds, they got the little tiny stumpy legs because they were bred to go into badger holes. So helps if you have small legs to do that. So again, it's just like at one point there was a mutation and maybe a puppy was slightly smaller. I'm like, you know, it could be good if the dog is, the dogs are smaller because then they could help us with this problem. Or, hey, the legs are smaller than normal, so that could be good because it could help us with this problem. And then over many, many generations, we get the breeds that you see today. Um, for instance, I have as you've seen before in some of my other videos, a Sheltie, a Shetland Sheepdog. His bark can pretty much be heard across the neighborhood because they were Shetland Sheepdogs. They were used for um, helping 10 flocks of sheep. And it helped if there was like a wolf or something or some kind of predator snooping around the flock that the bark would travel enough distance so that the shepherd would be able to hear it and come to it and come help the flock. So they're actually made to be very quick and agile and he can turn like you wouldn't believe. And to also have this very echoing bark that can be heard over long distances. Um, something else about the Shetland sheepdogs is their instinct to keep things together, to herd them. And we've noticed that sometimes when we take him for a walk, he'll start nipping at our ankles because he wants to go a certain way and we don't. That's his herding instincts. He's trying to get us to go in a certain direction. So he'll nip at our ankles. That's something that he's been bred to do instinctually. Even though we don't have sheep, he still wants to herd things. All right, so that's the idea of natural selection. I hope it was educational, informative. If you have any questions, hit me up in our Google Classroom or send me an email. 
So my kids, my ducklings, I hope you are staying healthy and well, and I will talk to you later. All right. Stay well, my friends.